Welcome to the Fan Counter Celebrity Podcast, the only show on the internet that has not yet gotten the coronavirus. My name's Nick. Thanks so much for being here. If you're looking for us, we're on Facebook. Private group is Sharpie Nation. We do have a large group with 29,000 of you hanging out. Just search Fan Counters on Facebook and you'll find it there. Sitting to my left again this week for this wonderful interview that we promised you last week is none other than Brian Nelson Jr. Good evening, Brian. How are you? How are you, Nick? I'm good. Thanks. Excellent. Well, I don't have the coronavirus. I'm washing my hands constantly <laughs> and I'm not touching my face and doing all the sanitizing, going to the grocery stores, always sanitizing through the sanitizer, you know, all that stuff. Well, last week we promised you an interview with Kalina Kiff, who played Kelly on the new Leave it to Beaver. She was uh, Wally's daughter. And this is an interview that's been, I would say, since November in the making. I have tried to reach out multiple times and had some other people reach out. We asked Brian Levant to reach out. It's been crazy. But guys, she's here today. Kalina Kiff is on the line, and this interview with her starts right now. Coming to you from nowhere near the entertainment capital of the world, this is Fan Counters with Nick and Elizabeth on the Podfix Network. There was this mob of people, and they're screaming my name. Crazy fans. Stop following me. Don't come around my house. If you do, the cops are going to be at yours. If I'm having dinner with my wife, don't sit down at my table. Don't follow me into the bathroom. Can I take a picture? We're gonna, oh, my God. I think this guy wants to fight me. Ended up being a fan. I'm the only one that's ever been on Sam Jackson and lived to tell about it. <laughs> well, guess what? I have a big surprise for you. That's why we call it Fan Counters. <laughs> I don't think you're going to last on the air very yeah. long. I never thought I would say this, but Kalina Kiff, welcome to Fan Counters. Thanks for being here. (laughs) My pleasure, truly. Well, we're really glad to have you. Now, I want to start with a lot of questions about your early childhood, which you may not have specific answers, and I get it, because, look, you were six years old when you first started your career on Love, Sydney, and you had a guest spot on the Jeffersons before that. Was it your ambition that led you to want to pursue acting? Did your parents see something in you that pushed you in that direction? How did you get started in this crazy business? It was right place, right time. Uh, I was a teeny little thing in kindergarten. I looked about two and a half years old, and I was pushing, I was pushing four and a half at this age. <laughs> uh, and another mother at the school I attended in Hollywood approached my mother and said, your kid is so perfect for film and TV. Uh, I manage kid actors. Can I represent her? Now, my parents uh, had so little clue what this woman was talking about. They're from (laughs) West Virginia. And um, my dad's an ornithologist. He's a world expert on birds of prey. And at the time, my mother was an executive assistant running uh, various real estate properties for her boss. So they were so removed from Hollywood. Um, But they agreed to let this woman take me on an audition. And they, of course, went with her. My mom did in this case. And it was for, I believe it was for a Pentax camera commercial and we shot at the playboy mansion sans playboy models uh but i was in a bathing suit four years old at the playboy mansion and uh (laughs) was that your only time there i sadly or maybe in a good way uh (laughs) yeah that was my only time there okay uh anyway so that was my first job i was four years old and my parents said, all right, well, she didn't seem to mind it. And I got 11 jobs that year. So in a 12 month period, it was just nonstop uh, booking jobs. And my last one that year, um, my last two were the Jeffersons and then the Love Sydney pilot. Um, so when the pilot turned into a DV show, my parents having no experience were like, well, I guess we keep going. Uh, and we did. And then when it moved or it started um, in L.A. as the pilot, but then it moved to New York City and that just upended mm. my family's lives. Uh, so m- the majority of my time in New York, my mom was with me and then my dad would take turns, aunts and uncles, grandparents, friends of the family. So I always had somebody with me, um, but they were To answer your original question, not Hollywood people, and uh, that was probably for the best because they gave me some serious grounding, and every year they'd sit me down and say, hey, do you still like doing this? And every year until I was about 14, I answered, yeah, it's cool. It's a weird childhood. It's exciting and an adventure, so yeah, I'll keep doing it. And then when I was done, I was done. And what's really nice about that is, you know, there's a lot of ugly stories out there in Hollywood where there's a lot of stage parents Mm-hmm. And, it, and it seemed you didn't have that, so that's very nice. No, I was I was so blessed. Um, my family's really um, supportive of whatever I want to do creatively, but it was never about them and their goals. 
Uh, in fact, you know, local uh, kids from our church, you know, 20 years old, moving to California from Texas, uh, my parents would pay them to take me to work when we were working in L.A., um, and that helped them get their footing. I just I was surrounded by people that really tried to protect me and let me be a kid. So I'm really grateful that my short time acting was free social media and with people that really wanted to take care of me as a kid. You did get the opportunity to star in some of our favorite shows of the 80s and 90s. Uh, <laughs> some of mine were Family Ties. You played little Mallory on that show. You were also on an episode of Three's Company. Do you have any memorable moments maybe from those two shows or any other shows that you had these quick appearances on? Absolutely. Uh, I was so thrilled to be part of the Family Ties story, especially yeah. because it's one of the few things I still get recognized for because it was such an iconic episode. I mean, it's a Christmas story. So it was Mallory and Christmas past. Um, funny story. I do not have blue eyes, but uh, Justine Bateman does. That was always something um, I noticed right away. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> we had to do school in a different room than Michael J. Fox because he was in his last couple of years of uh, high school then. So I was in a room with Tina Yothers and Justine Bateman. And I remember on the door, um, on their door, it says, uh, we devour knowledge and on the door to michael j fox's schoolroom, it said we digest it <laughs> that was really cool um uh, let's see three's company oh my gosh that was such a fun experience i loved john ritter and he went out of his way to spend so much time with me um and it was all about kittens um i don't know if you remember the episode but uh i turn up looking for my kitten and the whole gang tries to help me find a kitten and they keep bringing me kittens that are not my own so of course they had animal wranglers on set with kitten after kitten after kitten so at the end of the show they let me pick a kitty and i had her for 17 years wow that's awesome yeah so that was probably my best crew gift ever <laughs> a kitten <laughs> i'm trying to think of any other good interesting ones oh, i was on tj hooker twice um so that was a lot of time spent with william shatner and he was similar to john ritter where he actually wanted to engage with me and i was a, a strange little precocious kid because i always looked a couple of years younger than i was and i was always really serious in fact i probably still am a bit too serious um so i would have these long esoteric conversations with uh these acting greats um but they never humored me they always made me feel like i was you know, maybe not one of the adults, but they they didn't make me feel uh, like a baby. So that That's was a really neat. interesting guy to work with. Mm -hmm. So you were 10 years old when you were first were on the new Leave at the Beaver, which was at that time still the Beaver. What do you remember of the audition process? How were you approached? And I mean, did did you hear of it? Did your agent? Did you have an agent at that time? And were you? Oh yeah. So how did that all uh, work well, out? I was actually I was actually nine years old when I uh, got the part because my birthday is so late in the year and we started in August. Um, so I was really young, but I remember the audition process. I feel like I auditioned for it four times. So the first audition and then three callbacks. And since I'd already been on a relatively successful show, um, I think that they were, they were interested in me because of that. I mean, also I fit the part that they were looking for. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that was helpful um, and I, I feel like I remember getting it and being so thrilled. Uh, I didn't get too caught up in whether I got roles or didn't. Um, my mom always, uh, she always prayed with me before, uh, we would go on an audition and say, God, open the right doors and close the wrong ones. Good. And, and that was a really good thing for a little kid to hear because then it's not about you not being good enough for the role. It's just, if this is the right fit or not. And, uh, so I, I never did get my hopes up very high for roles. It was just like, well, we'll see what happens. Uh, but for this one, I, of course, was really familiar with Leave it to Beaver, the original one. So I thought it would be really cool to be a part of it. Um, and I know it was down to me and one other actress who ended up playing my best friend on the show, J.J. Rutherford. Uh, and I can't remember Carrie's last name right now. but um, Hillahan? Regardless. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Carrie Hillahan. Brian uh, so is full of knowledge. it was down to the two of us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so I knew it was down to us, and I was just really peaceful about it and thrilled when I got it. So were you ever up for some sort of iconic role or on a, a big show that you didn't get that you remember? Um, there were a few films. Um, I feel like I auditioned for Barbara Streisand for something, but I worked almost nonstop. I did... 
a total of six and a half years on series. So it was very hard to audition for stuff when I wasn't on those because this is back in the day of 22 episodes per season. Right. So I didn't have a lot of time to not get parts. <laughs> um, I, and I know that sounds kind of sassy of me. No. And I wasn't, no, it's I wasn't really auditioning for big stuff, but it was because I was busy, uh, not because uh, I didn't have an interest. Um, no, I had a happy little career, so. So did you appreciate no, the experience of being on that show with Jerry Mathers and Tony Dow, kind of knowing they had the same childhood that you were at the time currently going through? Looking back, sure. I don't know if I would have really realized that as a kid. Um, but again, I was surrounded on that show, Emma of Sydney, by people that knew to behave in a certain way when there's a kid on set. And I think that Jerry and Tony... Um, I think they set a tone that this is a family show, along with Brian Levant, that um, you got to treat kid actors um, like kids, um, kids that have a job and have to show up, but you you got to you know take care of them. So I think a lot of their experience came through in that way that it became a family environment. We uh, we did an interview with Brian Levant, and it's pretty clear on why he would know how to treat children. Number one, he's a child himself. <laughs> he sure is. You're my favorite. <laughs> he's a great guy. He's he he was yeah, he was I really cool to talk to. Yeah. Yeah, I like to say that he's my surrogate dad. Now, I love my own dad, but during those years, I saw Brian more than I saw my own family, um, and I still try to see he, him and his family every year. Um, I go down and visit with my family as much as I can. Um, they're a big part of my life still. There were over a hundred episodes. <laughs> of the show, do any of them stand out or any of your favorites? Mm, I really enjoyed the one with all the animals. And again, I apologize. I can't remember the names of any of we them. We don't expect Shinker that Swim. at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, I loved that because we got to have the tarantula and we were on top of an elephant. And it's funny because I was so young that... Sometimes I confuse my own childhood memories with Kelly Cleaver's memories. Oh, wow. It's very strange. But then I realized, well, I was doing those things. Well, Lena and, was doing the things as Kelly, so they are kind of my memories. Oh, totally. <laughs> and, and you also said in the in the uh, rap party episode that you always called Barbara Billings your grandma because of course, same thing. Of course. You know, it's like you're living that. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, exactly. Well. Let's see, other uh, episodes. I really liked um, the one, it was uh, about a comic book in a dumpster, and we had to go find it. But it was so fun because we were all dressed up for Halloween. Um, and that my favorite one's probably Earth Angel. I do remember the name. I think that's what it was <laughs> called. Yep. It's the one where Kelly has a crush on Freddy. I think that's Earth Angel. And um, and so she has this big fantasy sequence where um, her parents and um, Beaver and June are all dressed like the Four Tops and singing uh, My Girl. I loved that episode. Wonderful dance moves on that one, too. Oh, Dude. my God. So <laughs> and Mary Ellen pregnant. So good. And a funny backstory on that is I think I was just past 11 at this age. And prior to that, I had a huge crush on Eric Osmond. Now, the writers got wind of this, but TV moving as slow as it does and writing taking time, by the time we actually made the episode, I was so over him. <laughs> <laughs> Did he ever find out about that? Did he ever find out about the crush? Oh, yeah, yeah. We joke about it all the time. I see Eric. I try to see Eric every year. Um, he's still one of the best people I know. Well, I will jump ahead just a second because uh, a fan question from Facebook, Carrie Walker actually asked if you had ever had a crush on a co-star like John, Kip, Christian, or Eric. So you kind of uh, answered that one with uh, Eric, but did you have a crush on the other boys at, at any time? Um, I think when I first met Kip, but remember, I was nine years old. I, I, think he was 14, I understand. So I thought he was super dreamy. Of course. But I think it would be a stretch to say that I had a crush on him. John, no, never had a crush, but he was as close to a brother as I could ever have. We laughed, we got into trouble, we fought, and we had to do school together. So we were together all the time. <laughs> and he's one of the funniest people on earth, and I'm one of the most serious people on earth. So sometimes we just drove each other mad. Um, but I just, I think he is one of the dearest people on the whole planet. So even though he drove me crazy. <laughs> Scott Hetrick, he's a 
New Leave It to Beaver super fan. He's putting <laughs> episodes out on YouTube. I don't know if you've mm. heard wind of that, but um, yeah, he's That's he's so cool. yeah, it's it, it's very cool because not only are they all edited out, but a lot of them are in very good condition considering the age that they are. Um, he's aiming to get all of them out there eventually. Right now, he's in the middle of season three, I believe. And so, yeah, eventually he'll he'll get he'll get to the end. Brilliant! What a sweetheart! I'm so excited. I got to go start uh, uh, stalking myself on YouTube now. Oh no! Well, now you can. Um, <laughs> he wants to know. Scott wants to know if there's anything on the show that made you uncomfortable to film, like maybe kissing. You had to kiss kiss Ch- Chad Allen. Uh, there was the mm-hmm. one with the. You were on a date with a boy. There are a couple different ones. There's a few. <laughs> uh, well, it's funny because I, I never minded the kissing generally. Um, I had to kiss uh, Giovanni Ribisi a lot. Um, <laughs> yep. I I didn't like the one about me getting my first bra. That was uh, the guest star was Brian Austin Green, who I oh. then went on to date for a little while. Um, but that was just, it's a little mortifying to be not only going through puberty, but then going through puberty on television. And then to have the show be about you going through puberty. Oh, my gosh. So painful. Um, I mean, I understood that that's what this show is about and uh, about kids growing up. So I know the the writers wanted to do it. But, oh, I was so mortified. You know, and I have to say, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was was just going to say, and when you look back at that, you know, a show about a preteen with their first bra, that's that's kind of, you know, as a kid, I didn't really think much of it. You know, it's like... Mm -hmm. You know, it's, you know, it's just another step in life that just happens. Like, and nowadays as an adult, it's like, hmm, that's, that kind of puts <laughs> you back. You like, yeah. Like, uh. yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was not my favorite one, but it was very nice to meet Brian. And it was a lovely time uh, getting to know him. So there was the bright spot. Um, and I also was very uncomfortable in Florida when we did the episode with uh, an older teen boy taking me out in his car. Um, I had a severe lack of chemistry with the actor. Um, generally, you don't get to pick who your romantic interest is on shows like these. And he was a lot older than me, and I don't remember his name, and I'm sure he was a lovely guy, but I was very uncomfortable. Um, But other than that, I feel like the cast and crew and writers and producers really protected me, and I grew up up feeling super safe. Is part of the coming-of-age episodes, like we mentioned, you know, the first bra episode, is it mostly uncomfortable because of the other kids that are on set? you know, that you're acting and doing this in front of? No, that's funny. I never really thought of it as embarrassing that way. It's just, it's more that, I mean, the the kiss with the older kid, that was definitely because I was uncomfortable kissing him Mm because I didn't really know him. Um, But I think the bra one, it was just, oh, when you're going through puberty as a girl, you're already aware that people are looking at your body differently. And so that one was, literally about everybody looking at your body sure. differently it was too meta for me um so it was less about the other actors i mean it's, it's not great to be like hanging out with john and him snapping my bra like <laughs> it's not it's not that fun um but it was more about your own sense of how your body will be seen in the world so it pretty much it pretty much magnified the feelings that you had exactly on the set anyway Exactly. And it just makes me now so grateful that I was a kid actor before social media and before everything was scrutinized so heavily. I just can't imagine what these poor kids go through now with, um, you know, Instagram accounts and people following your every move. They just can't win. Poor kids. The final season actually was, like you just mentioned, it was filmed in Florida. What was the difference between the two studios and was there did you like working in florida and like how did, how did the living situation work um i just turned 14 so it was kind of a bummer to leave um la cuz i was just you know starting to like boys and i was becoming um a competitive horse jumper so i was really not thrilled to be going to florida 
However, when we got there, it was really exhilarating because we had so much freedom. Um, and again, sort of harkening back to we're so lucky that we came up before things got crazy for kid stars. Um, we were on the precipice of being allowed to get into a lot of trouble because there was not a lot of oversight. Um, we, uh, yeah, we had very uh, long reigns. And uh, bars would have served us alcohol if we wanted it. It was really the Wild West for us. But nice. all of us were pretty good kids raised by very good families. So we didn't lose our minds. As far as the studios, uh, Universal Studios was not a studio. It was a parking lot. It was a construction site. There were four sound stages and two offices. There was nothing to do. Oh, there was a man-made hill where they were starting to build the psycho house. Oh, wow. um, so it was pretty boring. Mostly, I remember Eric making short films and commandeering John and I to perform in them. So that was the kind of uh, stuff we'd get into on the lot there. And the two of them were always lighting off fireworks. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I found them very boring at this age. Um, yes, we got into way more hijinks on the back lot in Los Angeles. Oh my gosh, the trouble we got into. The uh, the security guards always shaking their fists at us. <laughs> we love to <laughs> mess with the uh, Universal Studios in LA has the uh, the tour, the trams that go through. Yeah. And we used to sneak into the psycho house and like be in the windows and scare them. Or there's a section where it looks like a flash flood and it's all controlled water. And Eric, John and I, we would ride our bikes uh, into that area when a tram was coming and we would pretend that we were getting caught in the flood. It was not, not nice for these poor, for these poor tour guides. Um, yeah. So we got into a lot of trouble. Good so, trouble. So, so the two studios, you know, the, the, the last season was everything was in a sound stage. So anything that was filmed outside was also in a sound stage. Did that do anything to your acting? I know a lot of actors, they have like this, they have their routines and they have like certain things that they like for their atmosphere. Did that do anything to your acting or did it feel different? Um, for me, I was less concerned about environment than costume. I had to feel really comfortable in my own skin to be able to give, give a good performance. And I don't mean I couldn't be distracted. Like I could goof around in between takes, no problem. But if I didn't feel like the, the, the clothes fit, the moment or or me then I was kind of distracted but I didn't find the environment distracting I always preferred acting in a in a real place so to speak like if we're outdoors in a park it felt better um but it it's it's like working in green screen um you're still in the character uh if you're if you're doing good work it's like working in a theater it might be a black box theater it might be green screen or it might be you're truly in a palace um it's really about what's inside your head. Was wardrobe willing to work with you when you didn't feel comfortable or was that pretty much, well, these are the clothes that, you know, you're using for this scene. Generally, they were really accommodating. I mean, I never threw a fit, but you know, as a 12, 13 year old, you're into fashion a little bit. So they took, they certainly took uh, my requests seriously. Um, always within the realm of it still had to work for the entire show. Um, but yeah, it was very surprising how respected we kids were. I want to move on to your appearances on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. I think you were on that show four times. Am I right Right about that? Yeah, I don't know what the true story is. It's either four or five. I used to say five, but then I thought, oh, maybe that's an apocryphal story. <laughs> I remember four for sure. Okay, for and there's sure. four dates, four, four different okay. dates that I had found. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that's the number, but you know, you're the person who lived it. So. Yeah, it's sort of fuzzy. Yeah. <laughs> So did you realize how special that opportunity was to be on one of those late night talk shows, to be on with Johnny Carson? And what, what are your memories of doing those interviews? I loved doing those interviews. Um, again, being such a serious kid, I loved being taken seriously. And I loved um, making people laugh with being a smart ass. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tony Randall really trained me. Um, to appreciate 
theater and opera and art. I mean, the guest stars that we had on Love Sydney were Suzanne Farrell, the the, the prima ballerina of, of the American Ballet. We had Itzhak Perlman giving me um, uh, violin lessons. So when I had the opportunity to be on Johnny Carson, it was because of his relationship with Tony Randall. And so I knew I had to represent Tony well, and he was a very intimidating figure. So I showed up with a great deal of gravitas, mm -hmm. as much as a six-year-old could muster. Right. Um, did I realize what a big deal he was to the world? Probably not. Uh, did I realize it was being broadcast to millions of people? Yeah, I did, because I knew that it got more viewership than our TV show, which right. was also on NBC. Um, but it was more about um, making sure I represented Tony and the classiness that I felt that uh, he put into the world. I wanted to represent that well. And when I saw that I could make Johnny Carson laugh, oh my gosh, that was great. Um, so it was, it's really fun to look back at those videos, especially the two when I was really young and see me watching him and, and playing him because I don't, I don't think he knew what to expect. So yeah, I have really fond memories of that experience or all four of them. Yeah, and the reactions of Johnny Carson, he didn't laugh like he did with your appearances, like, you know, with every actor. In fact, it, mm -hmm. it was only a couple of few times that I've seen, mm -hmm. you know, and he's he's <laughs> laughed hysterically with a lot of different guests, but not yeah. all the time. <laughs> Well, a kid actor is kind of a trained monkey, so I, I think that they, they go into those <laughs> interviews like, all right, here, trot out the monkey, but <laughs> I think he was really pleasantly surprised that he had a foil for his comedy. Had, One other ahead. fun thing mm -hmm. is my lifelong crush on Jimmy Stewart uh, began when I met him behind the scenes uh, on Johnny Carson. He was another guest one of the nights. I can't. I think it was the second time I was on. Um, but yes, ever since then, I'm like, well, he's the most debonair man that has ever lived. Well, what was the interaction like? Is it something he said or just the way he looked oh, at you no, or no, what? No, no. It was just a, just a very elegant gentleman. Okay. Uh, and I think it was uh, just a handshake and a nice to meet you, Mr. Stewart. And I seen um it's a wonderful life uh, at christmas time with my family so i i was somewhat familiar with him so on the tonight show you did mention your love of horses uh mm -hmm. you know which your character kelly cleaver was a was a horse enthusiast you got your own horse after mm -hmm. you had worked in a stable for a, for a few days D do you still have that love of horses today and do you do you own a horse now um, wow. Yes, I still love horses. Um, that episode, I forgot. The horse that I rode in that episode, I bought him. So he wasn't really a crew gift, but I bought that horse and I shipped him from Florida to L.A. And I had him until he died in his, uh, I think he was 31 when he died. Um, so, yeah, my love of horses was abiding. Um, when I went to college, uh, I gave him to my sister, though, uh, because I couldn't take him to the big city. I moved to Montreal in Canada to go to university. And so she ended up being able to have a short riding career. And I trained horses every summer during university. But once it was time to grow up, I left it behind Um I have been back on the horse in the last few years and back to jumping very casually. Um, career has definitely taken over as of kids, uh, but I would absolutely love to devote more time to it in the future. You just mentioned your sister. I'm assuming you're talking about Juanita, right? Yeah. Our next question <laughs> is about her. She appeared in a couple of episodes as a young version of your character, how did that, how did, how was that for you too? Were you on the set together at one point or how did that yeah, work I imagine out? that, I feel like I was there. I remember watching her do the Itsy Bitsy Spider um, scene. Um, and uh, she was hired because she was my sister. I think that was something that, uh, that Brian really loved to do. Like the fact that Eric and Christian Osmond are in the show. Again, it's all that family um uh, making it a, a family or in <clears throat> gosh wally um his son christopher plays him in a basketball game flashback so i i think they just loved the idea of real family being in it so that's why she was in it and what's really funny is is that she turned out to be not particularly um how do i put this 
she didn't have a knack for acting, a natural innate ability for it or patience for it. It just wasn't her thing at all. And what's interesting is she's really extroverted now and always has been. And she's an incredible entertainer. She's a larger than life personality, whereas I've always been much more introverted. Um, So we always thought that that was so interesting that acting worked for me, but was not interesting for her at all. Yeah, you mentioned family, you know, being a part of that show. They had, well, they had John Snee's little brother, same thing, played a younger, Mm -hmm. younger version of him. Uh, They had Kelly Bank, Frank Bank's daughter, was also on the Mm -hmm. show. So yeah, it there's yeah there was quite a few of that in the show. Mm-hmm. So what is Juanita doing now? Uh, she's an art therapist here in Canada. Um, she's married to an amazing guy, and they do really great work in the small community they live in. They work a lot with um, the indigenous communities and just make life better for people. Very nice. Mm-hmm. Now, Kalina, as you've heard on Fan Counters, I've been collecting stories from people about their memories working with Heather O'Rourke, and you had the opportunity, you're my first person to um, interview about being on camera with her. So I was wondering if you can share some stories that you might have working with her. Yeah, that was a relationship. I mean, she was the first person I ever knew to die. Um, I guess I was maybe 11 when she died. That was so shocking. Um, uh, she came onto the show to be my nemesis. And this is, of course, post Poltergeist. So we were all very excited to have her. She mm-hmm. was, you know, wow, Heather will work. Um, I found her very aloof, but very kind. She was like me in the seriousness department. So we got along very well. Um, and a couple times outside of work, um, we baked cookies or we would hang out with uh, my guardian, her mother. So, I tried to sort of welcome her into our little team of kids. Um, we had so many guest stars cycling in and out. It was, um, it was hard to keep uh, in touch with everybody, but because she was a recurring character, um, I really, I liked the idea that we could be friends as well. Um, and unfortunately that was cut very short. And it was actually not too long after her last appearance on the show. Exactly. I don't believe that that was meant to be the end of her time on the show the last time she was on it. So, um, yeah, I had every expectation that we would continue to be friends because um, we did have a lot in common. Now, I did hear a prank that the Cleaver kids would play on Heather, and apparently the kids would mess up their lines on purpose, forcing a cut. And then Heather obviously was very good at her lines, would try and help them remember, only to find out that they were doing it on purpose. Do you remember a prank like that happening? Not at all. Not even a little. Uh, like I, I, that sounds so far fetched to me for a couple reasons. Um, we didn't really prank a lot on set. Like that just wasn't our way. Sometimes we would get the giggles and we couldn't control ourselves. Yeah. But most of the time, all of us, as much as we got into hijinks offset, we showed up to work. We got her done. And we had to do, you know, sometimes seven pages of dialogue and it's all about us. So we knew that there wasn't time to to mess about. So I don't think we would ever force a cut. Um, And I also don't think that we were mean like that. I don't think we would play pranks. So I don't recall that, but maybe it's true. Well, you know, I had talked about this with, uh, we have a mutual friend and he was a guest on the the show previously, Brian Pokras. And um, he, he thought that that was completely not uh, something that would have happened either. And I thought, well, I'm going to ask her anyway, just to see what the real story is. But yeah. I, and if it did, I think that that's awful. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I don't think you did. That's terrible. But no, I don't think that happened. I'm on your side here. <laughs> um, uh, but while we're here talking about um, encounters with people, let's talk about encounters with fans a little bit. I'm wondering about fan experiences that you might have had, maybe ones that stand out for being just weird or awkward or even those fun encounters that you had with your fans uh, during the run of the show or maybe even after. I'm trying to think of the first time. I remember one time when I was on the Sydney, I was trying to get out of a cab or something and a crowd of people surrounded me. And this is uh, I was probably like six or seven years old and my amazing set teacher, um, her name was Irene Brastine. She said, get away from her, get away from her. And this woman said to her, don't you want her to be famous? <laughs> and she's like, why would I ever wish that on her? 
Um, and I, that really stayed with me. And um, that was one of the only times where I felt overwhelmed by fans. Most of my fans that I remember were people that wrote to me. Um, uh, so like a fan mail kind of situation. And I had quite a few babies named after me. I think that I, I, I lost count around seven huh. um, that I know about. Um, in fact, I'm still in touch with one. Uh, she's, um, she's a Hopi Indian in Arizona. And, uh, so I still know her and her family through Facebook and my dad's gone down to meet them cause he's worked down there a bit. Um, in fact, recently, well, five years ago, maybe eight years ago, a while ago, my, my accountant, uh, named his daughter after me. So that was always kind of cool that you'd run into somebody and say, I named your kid, my kid after you. Um, I'm trying to see if there's anything else because I do still occasionally get glances where people go, I know you from somewhere. Um, when I first moved to Canada, I worked on, uh, I worked it for a couple shows and two people on those shows admitted to me later that they were huge fans of the new leave it to beaver and they had such a hard time talking to me. And it was so funny <laughs> to hear that because I'd known them for years at this point, but apparently, uh, the show had a, a good fandom here in Canada. So I'm always just a little confused. Like, oh, <laughs> me? Oh, okay. Kalina, you've worked with many stars during your time in the TV and film industry. Were there any stars that you'd become starstruck around? Mm, starstruck. Um, I had the opportunity as a producer to work with Emma Thompson. And the first time we met, I was... <laughs> maybe not at my coolest um but uh i rose to the occasion and uh ultimately found a lovely relationship with her so, does that mean you were uh, a little overwhelmed definitely starstruck. yes exactly like you know she she walked into the forest we were shooting in and it looked like uh god was shining a light on her in this <laughs> misty forest and you're just like oh my gosh that's a movie star <laughs> um but generally i think because i grew up in the industry um, I mean, my best friend when I was five, her mom was Natalie Wood and her dad was Robert Wagner. Like, I was always around famous people. And they're just people. They just happen to, you know, have a special spark that makes it work for a big screen. Um, so, no, I, I guess the most starstruck I've ever been was meeting uh, the novelist John Irving, who um, we can talk about this later, but I'm working on a project with him. And I've been slightly obsessed with him since I was 10 or 11 years old and meeting him in person. I thought I might, I might pass out. <laughs> um, but he broke the ice brilliantly and gave me a big hug as soon as he met me and immediately put me at ease. So um, that's the only time that I felt that, that sense of, Oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm meeting this person. I saw it in my, my daughter recently though. She met Justin Bieber and I have to admit that was, <laughs> oh, that was a pretty intense experience for both of us. Did she pass out? She didn't, but her friend did. Oh, no. I'm no. Not kidding. Not kidding. She sat, I mean, he luckily had left at this point, but she sat down on the pavement and nearly passed out. But yeah, that's a, a strange level. Like, fame is so different now. Um, but yeah, I tend not to lose my, my mind too much. I've always asked this question to some, a lot of actors, and some have really good answers. And it's like either you can answer this question or you totally can't. So when you think back about an episode because obviously these shows are not easy to watch this new leave it to beaver show um but when you think back to an episode does that bring back memories of something that was going on in your personal life while you were filming it like oh my gosh i remember during this episode you know i i had late homework or you know just something in your personal life um get sparked by watching an episode for sure for sure um in fact um i don't know if the episode was called string of pearls but um, that factors into it. I know, maybe that's not it. Chew slowly. Anyways, I remember an episode where um, I was playing Cinderella or Sleeping Beauty. Oh, yes, yeah, Sleeping Beauty with Chad Allen. Right. So I remember an episode where I was playing Sleeping Beauty in the school play. And I got very sick during that episode. Um, I got pneumonia and they had to shut down the show. And so when I watch the episode I can see how sick I am and how I'm trying to hold it together it was the day before we wrapped and it's this beautiful scene between myself and Barbara Billingsley and she's pretty much telling uh, 
um, Kelly, she's saying, don't rush through all these little phases of your life. Enjoy them, savor them, chew slowly. Um, so yeah, I can really remember that day very specifically and how sick I was wow. <laughs> and how I was trying not to let anyone know. Um, so yeah, I can definitely remember moments. So Kalina, bring us up to speed about what you're working on these days. I've seen during my research, because I do a lot of research on my guests, that you're the co-founder of Curiosity Pictures with quite a resume of films that you have now produced and directed. Can you tell us about some of that work that you've been doing there? Yeah, I have a little boutique production company with my business partner, Galen Fletcher. Uh, We make uh, movies that uh, we find really curious. That's why we called it Curiosity Pictures. We don't make things that are the same genre every time or the same format. We'll do a web series, then we'll do a documentary, then we'll do a feature film or a television series. We're really just driven by uh, the adventure we can have with the stories we tell. So we don't make a lot of movies. It takes a long, long time to um, get the creative right and then to start raising the money, let alone making it, um, and then editing it and getting out into the world. So it's really a labor of love for both of us. Um, I would say the film I'm most proud of uh, is a mockumentary called No Men Beyond This Point. And it was directed by Mark Sawyers, who also wrote it. And it's about men going extinct and whether or not we should save them. And it is so smart and so funny. Uh, It's currently being developed for television. uh, So we'll see where that goes. Um, I had a great time making a film in Scotland, the one I mentioned with Emma Thompson. Um, We were lucky enough to win two BAFTAs for that, uh, BAFTAs in Scotland. Um, that was called The Legend of Barney Thompson. That was really uh, exciting to be able to work with A-list talent like Emma and Ray Winston and Robert Carlyle. Uh, And most recently, in fact, two days ago, let's see, um, in fact, on March 10th, uh, iTunes is now uh, carrying Stuffed, which is a documentary I just produced that was at South by Southwest last year, and it's about taxidermy artists. (laughs) And that one... um, It was a very strange thing to take on because we'd never done a documentary before, but I was so fascinated by the world. And of course, growing up with a dad who's a biologist, I was really familiar with birds as taxidermy, but I never really thought of it as art. So this uh, adventure of making this film really changed my mind. And we got to go all over from Netherlands to New York to South Africa. And what an adventure it was. Oh, oh, and the John Irving thing. Uh, Yeah, we're adapting uh, his novel Until I Find You into a television series. And that is an uphill battle that I cannot wait to take on. I'm so excited to be partnering with him. That's awesome. Wow. Mm-hmm. You think that's a 2020 thing or, or next year? Oh, no, it wouldn't be a 2020 thing. TV is really funny. It's really slow until it isn't. And then it's just nonstop. Okay. Um, so it takes a very long time to develop a television show and to get it set up with a broadcaster and network. So don't hold your breath for, uh, <laughs> for 2020. I'd say late 2021 if everything goes right. You have been credited a lot as a visual effects producer on a lot of shows, including one that I was a huge fan of called Timeless. What exactly did you do? Maybe say, just humor me on Timeless because I'm very familiar with the show. What do you? Ha- what, what's that role to bring the script to life? A visual effects producer, I joke, is a how do I put this? Uh, an English to English translator between the tech guys that do the visual effects and the creative people that dream up the crazy thing that needs to become a visual effect. So the the writers and the producers. Um, so. I was um, able to be part of the team that developed both of the time machines and how time travel looked and worked and functioned from a visual effects point of view, because, of course, there was um, a practical, which is what we mean by like a real physical object that they would climb, the actors would climb in and out of Mm -hmm. on Timeless. Um, But the way that it would disappear or reappear was what we did as visual effects. Um, And I had worked with Eric Kripke on Supernatural, and he has a really specific style that I think he brings to all of his shows, which is sort of gritty and real world authentic. And that's what he wanted for um, the lesser of the two time machines. He wanted it to feel like a clunky old car version (laughs) of a time machine. So it was really fun to collaborate with him and with the uh, incredible visual effects artists that actually did the work on on Timeless. And it was so fun. I mean, one of my degrees is in American history. So I was so jazzed about doing a TV show that's about history. Um, It was a really fun one to be a part of. 
you guys did a great job on that entire show with the, the time machine and all of that. I mean, and, and yes, you're right. The historical aspect to it brought so much more interest in it when they're interacting with historical figures. Uh, that whole show was brilliant, and I wish it hadn't ended. Yeah, I think time travel is a tricky one. I think yeah. people wear out on the science on those too quickly. But yeah, I really enjoyed it, and it was, um, yeah, I was happy to be part of it. So now we are going to wrap up with some more Leave it to Beaver questions. One thing I've always wondered, you know, there's a lot of a lot of things out there in you know, a lot of interviews that say how great of a person Barbara Billingsley was. She, she was gracious. She was so nice. What are some specific memories that you have of her? Well, Barbara was so generous with all of us kids, uh, always, you know, birthday presents and Christmas presents. But she also <laughs> she she was really playful we would ask her to speak jive to us, which is so politically incorrect now. But as kids, we'd seen Airplane, and we thought it was so hilarious to get Grandma speaking jive. So I don't know if you can you can play that, but yeah, that was pretty great. And then the last time I saw Barbara, um, this was probably about two years before she passed, uh, Eric Osmond and I went to see her. We were taking her out to dinner. But beforehand, when, when we arrived, she said, oh, no, 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 I, I'm going to do some more d'oeuvres before we leave. Um, now, we got to talking uh, with her. We're sitting in her living room. It's lovely. And then all of a sudden, we smell smoke. What? <laughs> she burnt the hors d'oeuvres. Oh, no. no. June Cleaver burnt the hors d'oeuvres. <laughs> At least yeah. they weren't cookies. <laughs> No, they weren't cookies. So, yeah, Barbara was, she was so much uh, both June Cleaver and a real amazing person. There was an outtake in the rap party episode. They surprised you for your birthday, but noticed that they had to cut out the singing of Happy Birthday. So, was that due to the song's copyright? Is, is that what happened? I imagine it. I imagine that's why, um, although when I watch that and I don't hear them sing Happy Birthday and then it goes into the uh, the score, I weep every Aww. time. <laughs> it's so moving. And I, I got to tell you, they made a little bit of a birthday monster out of me. Stopping an entire set, rolling film on me blowing out my candles every year. Oh, my gosh. So now I really like to have a big birthday. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. So we mentioned earlier that there's shows out there on YouTube. Do you do you have any of these episodes? I do. Eric put them all onto a, a USB stick for me because um, nice. that's what I gave my mom for Christmas two years ago because she wanted them so badly. Um, so because she of course didn't get to experience all of those days with me because she was at her job and I was at my job. Um, so she really likes having those. So I have them. I have them all. That is very cool. You're one of the few people we found to have them all. Mm-hmm. Kip had said yeah, that Eric he did Kip have them. Dash. Yeah, Kip said that he did have them, but he has them stored somewhere and he's wants to find them and, you know, and well, who knows where they are. We have quite a few on VHS. In existence are quite a few VHS tapes, too. Awesome. I've got two fan questions that came in pretty recently, so I want to hit those up. Brian Watkins on Facebook asks, was it during the filming of the new Leave it to Beaver that your interest in directing and producing first got you you know, interested in it? And did any of the adult directors have an influence on that? Hmm. No, I don't think it did start there. Um, I always thought I'd be a writer. I was very interested in that, and, and I still do write. Um, I've been sort of ghostwriting features for years. Um, but I don't think that it really started there. I think my, my comfort on a set and my... Uh, innate ability to understand how many moving pieces there are certainly began there um, watching how it all worked. But I think it was more by osmosis than any (laughs) um, um, (laughs) plan, let's say. Well, when it comes to that, it it sounds like, you know, from talking to everybody else that we have talked to that in, in you were younger at this point, but Brian Levant, is like an excellent person to be working for in this industry to want to get in to that part of the industry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's a real advocate and uh, he takes care of the people um, that work hard for him. He really has always. Uh, in fact, my business partner Galen was his assistant for years um, and he kept moving up under Galen or sorry, under Brian. 
Um, but yeah, he's a real champion of people. He's, uh, he's tried to get me some directing work here and there. Um, I think our tastes run different. I'm a little more dark humor. He's a little more light humor. Um, but hopefully someday we'll get to make something together. Fans also want to know, is there a way to request an autograph? Do you have ways for them to do that? <laughs> oh gosh. Oh, wow. Well. Like, mm-hmm. do you ever do conventions or anything like that? No, that's crazy talk. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> I, I I did some. I, I created. Um, I co-created a web series that was in the sci-fi space. So we had done Comic Con, uh, both in LA and New York, with that. It was called Reese Kingdom Falling on Sci-Fi. Um, so we did do cons for that, but no, I've never done one for myself as an actor. I just think that's like, sort of far-fetched and ludicrous. Um, <laughs> you might be surprised. I don't know if I'd say yes to an autograph. I met Paul Newman on an airplane once. And he was with Joanne Woodward, who I'd met the night before because we, uh, I had gone backstage. She was on Broadway, and I went to meet her. And so my mom said, go get his autograph. Go on. And so I toddle up to Paul Newman, and, uh-huh. and I ask him for his autograph. And he's like, oh, I'm sorry. I don't give autographs. And I was seven at the time. Oh. Seven years old. Ouch. Maybe. And I said, oh, why not? Oh, and nice. He said, it's a oh, philosoph- you asked him. It's a he, He's, oh, yeah. I said, can I have an autograph? He said, no, I don't give them out. And I said, why not? Because I was seven. You get to ask why. Yeah. And he said, it's for philosophical reasons. And Joanne Woodward, <laughs> she elbowed him so hard and said, give her the autograph. So I have a Paul Newman autograph. Now that's However, cool. However, in retrospect, I'm like, yeah, I don't know if I, I really needed his autograph. So, I, I mean, I guess people could request, but I probably wouldn't do it. I mean, it's not because I'm not nice. I just don't. I think it's weird. Hey, that's okay. To have my autograph out there. So <laughs> This show has always been a judgment-free one, so you are entitled okay. to do whatever you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm grateful that people still care. I mean, it's so flattering to be asked to uh, talk about myself um, and my funny childhood memories because it was uh, a fun and wild ride. There was one more question that I had regarding the horse episode in the new Leave it to Beaver. Now, you were, you were an accomplished horse rider at that point. Were you able to make that jump yourself or did they have to get a stunt person for you? Oh, no, that was me. That's. Yeah, that, that's me. I know they get it funny sometimes. They don't want to put the yeah, actors they in do. danger. They, oh yeah, my gosh, yeah. after I got pneumonia, they wouldn't let me do anything. I would go towards the outdoors and everybody would be running towards me with sweaters or jackets. Oh gosh, they were so protective. <laughs> but it was less about physical stuff because my character rarely had to be physical. All right. And my last question is, is there any story that we didn't think about the question to ask you? That would make a great one to leave, uh, you know, this interview with. I guess, hmm, with regards to Florida, um, I imagine you guys have seen the future episode, and with uh, Joaquin Phoenix being in the news, it's mm-hmm. sort of interesting. Yeah. Um, I became really close with him and his sister Summer, um, and I would spend weekends up in Gainesville at their family's property, and this is when, of course, River was still alive. And that was a really special time for me because I, it was hard for me to be in Florida, um, away from all my friends, um, and, you know, just about to start high school. So having them sort of take me into their brood for those weekends was a really nice respite from, you know, being stuck in Orlando, working a job. Um, and they were just such warm, genuine, um, fun people. And I felt really lucky, um, to be able to have connections like that. And by no means were they the only people that did that. Their names are just more recognizable. Mm-hmm. But throughout my time on Leave it to Beaver and on Love, Sydney, the connections I made, the people that I got to meet, it was, I mean, it was such a charmed life. And I'm so happy that that's how, um, how it went down for me in my childhood. And, and it's, kind of, it's kind of ironic, too. And this happened in an episode before you worked with the phoenixes you had mentioned you'd said something like in a sarcastic way you were like maybe i can start a river phoenix fan club or something (laughs) i might have already had one of my own at that time no i was a big 
big fan of River as a as a young girl, and um, certainly when Leaf, as I knew him, uh, broke out on the scene, I, uh, I crushed on him. So to be able to meet him and spend the time I did was pretty cool. That's great, Kalina. We really appreciate your memories of your childhood, sharing them here on Fan Counters, and uh, definitely appreciate your your hour that you spent with us. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. It was, Such a pleasure. Yeah, it was great talking to you, Kalina. Yeah, it was a real pleasure, and again, I'm so flattered. And um, um, thanks for uh, for still watching. Our thanks to Kalina Kiff for joining us on Fan Counters and uh, this web webcast, I guess you could call it, for everybody listening. Um, the one thing that struck me at the very end, and you know, you never know what somebody's going to say because all the questions we prepared, right? So we had come up with all that stuff, but the one question at the end was all her as far as you know, what memory does she have or what can she share with us that, you know, we didn't know to ask about. Never thought that she would have been hanging out with the Phoenix family. You just never know who people know, especially when you're on a TV show, uh, who you would run into and hang out with and then what they would later become. You mentioned that the other week when you talked about the Joker, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, now he's he's known as Joaquin. Back when they worked together, he, he went by the name Leaf. And yeah, and and now he's in a huge blockbuster movie. I mean, these are the Phoenixes, you know. They're definitely no stranger to Hollywood. But uh, yeah, it was it was really cool to hear her story with her experience with the Phoenix family. Well, we're really appreciative, Kalina, that you were on the show. Next week, we've got another celebrity guest joining us. Big television star, comedian. I'm not going to tell you who it is. You got to come back for that. But I promise you it's going to be a great show. So we'll see you next week. If you want to email us in the meantime, your comments or questions on the show, you can send those to hello at fancounters.com. Have a great night, everybody. We'll talk to you next Friday. Bye-bye.